All righty, folks, we are at day seven of our 10-day boot camp. Uh, we've been through a lot together. This is going to be the show where we uh, we really can go lots of different angles based on your question. The intent of this show is really a couple of fold. One, again, much like Dion's conversation, we all start somewhere. We heard last week where Dion started with $300,000 in negative equity, was a single parent to three, 17 bucks an hour, and he made it work. With Matt, we're going to hear about being a ninth grade dropout. Didn't even make it past the ninth grade. Typically speaking, that does not set you up for success. So we will start with the struggle. We'll talk about um, you know things that went through that. We'll talk about the 08 crash and how it impacted him. But then we'll talk about house hacking. How important was that for him? We'll talk about something he uh, created called the 4321 strategy. And then most importantly, and probably most of this conversation, we'll talk about, oh, blank, you're a landlord. Because as you know, with the three amigos, Dion is responsible for getting people out of the parking lot, into the stands. I try to take you from the stands to the field. And then once on the field, it is all this guy. So there is nobody better on the team that has a handle on what's going on as a self-manager uh, construction experience and all of that. So uh, Matt, there will be a lot of people watching this because just like Dion, I want to give this out to the world. Okay. Uh, so most people probably haven't heard of you and your story. You know, give us two or three minutes on who you are. So, well, good morning, all you hard workers. Good to be with you guys. Um, so my name is Matt, I'm the Lumberjack Landlord. Uh, I've been doing this for a little over 20 years. Zuber and I have about the same amount of time in the business. Um, we both lived in the dot-com bomb, being working in tech. Um, we both uh, made it through 08, 07, 08, um, in different ways. <laughs> Mike did a better job of making it through that period than I did. Um, but yeah, I started my journey, ninth grade dropout. Uh, understood I was bored out of my mind in school. Uh, very entrepreneurial. I opened my first business when I was 11 years old. Uh, I was mowing lawns and uh, delivering newspapers. And then I got into sports cards and started selling sports memorabilia. And so uh, I kind of always had a job and I always had, I always worked a ton and I just, I really liked working because I really liked achieving things um, and, and being able to get things. And so um, when you finally, when I finally got old enough um, and I had a real job, um, I started looking at real estate cause I didn't like the stock market. It was too unpredictable. There's it's an inside job. You can believe what you will. Um, but I don't live in Manhattan and so I don't get whisper numbers at parties. Um, mm -hmm. so from my perspective, I wanted something that it was the great equalizer, which was, it was about my market, what I could understand about my market. Um, I failed in a couple markets, I guess you could say failed. Um, I bought in, uh, I bought a condo just outside of Boston, huge fail. Uh, I house hacked. I had a roommate uh, that that paid. And then I, when I went to go sell, I got hit with a $70,000 assessment because it was a condo. It wiped out, wiped out every dime of my equity. Um, and so I was able to sell thankfully, but, and not have to write a check, but I walked out of something where I should have walked with 80 grand and I walked with 10. Um, and then that, that was I, a special assessment, right? That contract? was special assessment. Yeah. The, the previous contractor used the wrong type of siding for where the building was located close to the ocean and he was bankrupt. So we couldn't get any money. So the special assessment. And so I tried house hacking that way, but then I really liked that. I was like, I can get a whole lot more house if I'm hacking. And I did it with roommates or a roommate in that particular case, uh, bought a single family house, did the same thing with roommates. Um, but I was in my early twenties. Like I'm not unrealistic to and think single. Insane. Yeah. Single. Yeah. Single, no kids, no wife, no girlfriend, nothing, literally nothing. It just me and my career, just a workaholic. Um, and so I loved that and it was great. But then I got to a point where I was like, okay, I kind of hate having roommates. And so then I said, I need to do multifamily because I can live in my own unit. And then the other two people living there in the other units can pay my mortgage. Um, and then I did my first one. And then I went to go do my second one and the bank said, oh no, you can't do that. And I was like, what do you mean you can't do that? They're like, you can't go from a three to a four. I was like, what? Where is that rule written? They're like, well, now we believe that you're using our loans for investment purposes. And these were FHA uh... loans. So they said, we think you're losing it for investment purposes. I said, no, I'm trying to move. And they said, yeah, we're not going to approve that. So I learned that's that was what birthed the four, three, two, one. 
was the fact that if you go in that type of fashion where you start at the four, you go to the three, you go to the two, you go to the one, you can usually go across from a four to a four. You can justify that it's in a better neighborhood. You can justify it's a better commuting location. You can justify all these other types of things, but that's kind of where that came from. But um, fast forward now, um, 46, 137 units will be up to 148 by spring next year because we've got two development projects we're working on. Um, well, we'll be at 148 or 160 something depends on what gets approved. Um, but now I do, I've done everything I've bought from every source you can buy from, uh, I've bought from tax recoveries. I bought from short sale. I've bought, um, you name it. I've bought it. I bought private. I brought wholesale. Um, I've bought, uh, seller finance. I've bought 50, 40, 10 strategy. You name it. I've bought it that way, except for sub two. I, there's things about sub two that make me uncomfortable. Um, but that's all right. We'll leave those big boy pants in the corner. I'm going to not put those on. Those don't fit for me and my strategy and what I want to do, but fast forward. So that's where we are now. 137. I self-manage and, uh, my kind of plan is essentially acquisition, stabilization, optimization. Most landlords never get to optimization. Most are barely at stabilization. Um, and that's why the first five years sucks is because people really need to focus on how to get that asset really, truly under control, stabilized, but now also optimize it. So you then have greater returns and then banks are far more likely to work with you and lend with you. Yeah. I think in Dion's story, I think he said he's on his third house hack. I think I remember a conversation with you years ago. You have been through a significantly nine. not, yeah, nine, nine, nine and in 13 years. And more importantly, about was it six of those it was with your girlfriend slash wife? So, uh, Ashley, five, yeah, five of those. So, yeah, five of those were with um, my wife when we were boyfriend girlfriend. She, I didn't want her living with me. Okay, so when you were married, you went you yes. did that five times. Yes. Okay, um, was that always that was always in units? Yes, with her. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Yep. It was always in units, and so it was. Uh, it was tries. Uh, tries and then a try and then uh, duplexes. All the rest okay. of them after that were duplexes. Um, so as you're going through your journey, why don't we kind of, re it, it's not all sunshines and rainbows. The first five years suck. We've talked about that a bunch. Yep, they do. Um, where were you sitting when the 08 environment just came out of left field? Where, what, what, what'd you have and, and you know, what happened next? A lot of debt I had. <laughs> um, the... Uh, in 08, when that happened, so I saw it kind of a coming in 07, but I did, there wasn't anything I could do with it. I was fully leveraged. It was like literally watching a crane a train crash that you couldn't do anything about. And so I was pretty, pretty heavily leveraged. Um, and was it all fixed rate debt? Sorry. It was. Yeah. So not, you didn't have any of these crazy arms. No, okay, uh -uh. good. I was right. always looking at my friends. I think I would have lost all my properties if I had those. Oh, I, no, you absolutely yeah. Yeah. So yeah. not having them save me, even though in the, in the first two years before it, I was like, damn, I'd like some of that really cheap debt. That'd be great. Mm. Um, but couldn't get it. And so for some reason or another, I, I wasn't able to get it. And so, um, yeah, so we did that. And in, oh, uh, in August, uh, August of 08, I had eight paying units in September of 08. I had three paying units in October of 08. I had one paying unit. Ooh. I went eight, three, one. So I had one person paying their rent and the other seven decided not to pay. So I was in the position where I was literally saving up to evict people. That was my option. So that's where you learn to do a whole lot of stuff yourself is when you can't afford to pay anybody to do it. Yeah. And you know, that time frame for you that how long was that struggle? Was that like 18 months to kind of get to the other side where you finally could take a breath? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, I would say it was probably a couple of years. So yeah. a couple of years are really, really hard. And then it was, I couldn't buy investment property without moving into it. Cause I needed, I needed to be able to buy it for three and a half or 5% down. Right. I, so I couldn't, I, my option, my only option was if I'll you want to grow your business, you're going to have to go live in it and fix it up while you're in it. But right. that's where I did 203 K's. I did 203 okay. K streamline loans. Um, I was doing those when, uh, when Kevin was still working at Jamba Juice. <laughs> I like Kevin, Kevin. No, yeah, yeah two or three K loan is is the way to go. So, um, yes. what for people that don't know what it is, talk about why why it's important, why you were able to leverage that to keep going. 
Yeah. So a 203K, there's two versions of it. Most people don't know that. There's something called a 203K streamline and there's something called a 203K. A 203K is basically a construction loan, um, but it's done on an FHA property. The only downside to those products is that they don't let you GC the deal yourself. You actually have to hire a GC. Everybody has to be a third-party contractor. And so that makes it kind of challenging because that's one of the ways that I save. And that's how I learned construction was I was my own GC. Um, and so, uh, which is a general contractor. Um, and they require that on those deals. So on the 203, 203K, it's basically a construction loan. You get two numbers when you get it appraised. You get something called an as-is number and you get something called an as-complete number. The as-is number is as the building sits today. The as complete number is here's what the appraiser believes it's worth when the project is done. Um, then you're paying that three and a half percent down of the bigger number right. or the 5% down of the bigger number. Um, then there's something called a streamline, which is a limited at $35,000. However, that process, 35 grand gets you pretty far when it comes to rehabbing a unit to make it go from gross to livable. Um, it's not going to give you all that you need to gut to studs, but it's going to give you all that you need to get a lot of stuff good and upgraded and taken care of for sure. Yeah. I wanted to talk about this more because again, we're, I'm looking at where the opportunities are going to be for people today. <laughs> and I still think if you're, if you're playing below the median in most markets, not everywhere, but most markets, if the property passes FHA or VA inspections today, those are still moving. Yes. Probably shocking people how fast they move. Yes. But it's the ugly duckling. It is. The ones that don't do FHA, the ones that smell bad, the ones that haven't been touched since the 80s. This is why two like if so I don't know if this is this could happen, but I'm gonna ask. Can you 203k a multi-unit house hack? Can you live in one unit and do that? Yep. Ooh, that gets sexy. Yep. Yeah, that's what I did. I did two of them. They were awesome. I did 203Ks streamlines. I didn't even do the big, big full dock ones. I did just did the streamlines. So you're buying well, we, multi-units. Yep. You're moving in. You're spending yep. in the streamline up to 35 grand, which you get yep. in draws as works complete. Two, two draws, yep. You only two get draws. two draws. That's where they okay. help cut down the costs. Because on the big 203K full blowns, it's like three or 500 bucks every single time one of those guys shows up to give you a draw. And that's where the streamline comes in is that you get um, you get a draw in the beginning and then is and uh, when you start, you know, showing all these different pieces and parts, and hey, I've spent the money on materials, I've paid deposits for contractors, right. then you can are able to get that money, and then the next one you get is when the job is complete, and they pay it off. All right. Yeah, because I think I think where the opportunities, you, I mean, every market's hard. Real estate investing is always hard. Mm -hmm. It's just a different kind of hard. Today, yep. you've got to look for. I'm looking for larger days on market. I'm looking for non-beautiful properties below the median. Yep. I'm looking for ways to add values, you know, buying twos, creating threes, right? Adding a door, a, a wall, a closet, you know, all of the stuff that you're well aware of. There's plenty of opportunity, but it just takes more work. And if you can understand the lending options on top of that 203K, multi-unit fixer upper, you know, good stuff happens. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the key to it is, is that, you know, earlier in my career, I was only buying off MLS and Dion only buys off MLS yeah. and that's great, but it drastically slows down the pace by which you can grow. And no offense to Dion, it also drastically reduces the amount of deals you see and yeah. quite frankly, the home runs that you can hit. If you're only looking at MLS, you can still hit a home run. It's really few and far between though. That's really hard to do. If you're getting stuff from wholesalers, from agents that do off market stuff, if you've done some sort of a little mailer yourself where you've driven for dollars in your area, there's all these different ways where you can create opportunity. And that is by far a better opportunity for anybody. And those are the deals. My, my biggest home runs were deals that I either created myself or deals that, um, or deals that I got from a wholesaler. Yeah. You know, I my biggest... I'm going to make, I'm going to make a million dollars on one of my deals that I do with a wholesaler and I bought it from him two years ago. I'll make a million bucks on that deal. Yeah. I think one of the keys that you're sharing with folks and I agree with and try to repeat it as often as I can is tell everybody your buy box. Don't yes. be, scream it. Don't, don't be mm -hmm. shy. Don't hide it. It's not nope. about competition. You just never know who's going to be like, Oh, my next door neighbor's grandmother's dog walker. You never know. You know, I've, I literally got 
I literally got my best lead that I've gotten in the last five years from a tenant's boyfriend. I remember that one. Yeah. Tenant's boyfriend. He reached out to me. He's like, Hey, yeah. You know, my girlfriend rents from you. I was like, awesome. Who's your girlfriend? And he said who it was. I said, sure, sure. She's great. He's like, yeah. He goes, are you ever interested in looking at other properties? He's like, I, I, I'm kind of getting into real estate and I found this one deal and I, you know, it's kind of like what she lives in now. Is it something you'd be interested in? I said, absolutely. Would love that. So when we did a deal, I actually overpaid him. He asked for, I think like a $10,000 assignment fee and I gave him 15. Yeah. Some people are like, why would you give him more money? Because I got to see the next five deals he created. And one of yeah. those deals first. was a million dollar deal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You want to be, yeah. B being first in line is important. Always. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So very, very cool. Um, so I'd be remiss if we didn't. So you went through, you got started, you had a, hurt, a hard couple of years. Mm -hmm. You're coming out of this. And now mm -hmm. as you opened, right, over a hundred units, what was the big catalyst? What was the thing you look back and like, Hey, that was a game changer. Um, having the, uh, processes in place for explosive growth. Um, you and I are, had a little bit of an advantage, right? We've both run startups. We've both done startup on products. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when they go, okay, when you start being successful, we're going to put some money into this. You're like, I need some money to start with first. Yeah. Thank you for that idea. But oh. next, yeah. And so the idea is, is if you understand your process and you understand exactly how to evaluate a deal and you understand who you're going to call when the plumbing doesn't work at three o'clock in the morning, when you understand that stuff, that gives you the capacity and the ability to expand. And if you don't have that and you're expanding through the process, you're always going to be banging your head against the wall. And you're always going to be saying to yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? It is worth it. The issue is, is that most landlords are not business owners. And so they haven't put themselves in a position where they know what, what, where they understand what business owners understand. So I've run many small businesses. We've grown, I've grown them to 10, 20, $30 million uh, for other people. Um, and so knowing what it takes to run a business, and that's really the key is understanding, you know, having processes in place, having the network in place. Um, that allows you to expedite growth. And then it came down to the last step was funding. How did I get that additional funding? Well, my returns were great. I could show my bank and I shopped myself to my bank. And I said, you guys aren't taking the gamble on me, but with a backing asset of a house. And those are the kinds of conversations that small banks want to have. They're in the community of the community for the community. It, you need to get them on board with what you're trying to accomplish. And there's small banks in all of our areas that are that their charter is to be part of the community. Yeah. And invest that's one in of the, the things that's one of the things that you bring that really none of the other, you know, what we call the Avengers, right? Mike, Dion, I, and yourself uh, was building that relationship with the small banks on purpose. Yes. Um, so talk about how you make those introductions, how you go forward, how you continually build on those. Cause that really was the game changer. Cause I don't think you're at your unit count today without those relationships. Cause you leaned on them no hard in 2020 yeah. and 2021. I did. I did. It, it was, um, I have three banks that I work with, you know, two, one of them has a lion's share of my business because she's the best to work with. Um, the other two guys aren't as easy to work with, um, but she's fantastic. Um, and she's, she never says no. She always says, okay, let's see how we can do this. And I say, when you go to lending committee, cause that's what all of these small banks do once a week, they go to loan committee and they review every single deal in these smaller banks. Right. And when I say smaller banks, we're talking between a billion and 2 billion in assets. We're not talking yeah, so about how many branches you think these are like three, usually four you're, yeah, usually you're between uh three and seven. Okay. You're usually between three and seven branches. Okay. Um, and that's a small enough company where they probably have two or three or four loan officers. Um, and so the person that you're looking for is the senior lender. That's mm -hmm. the key. That's the person that holds the keys to the kingdom is the senior lender because that senior lender decides what they're pinning their rates to. Are they going off of a prime rate? Are they going off of FHLB? Are they going off of Fed? What are they basically pegging the rate to? 
and then they add their margin on. So when you guys right. see on TV that the Fed's what five or something like that, or four and three quarters, when right. you see it on TV, every bank then says, well, we have margin that we add on top of that. That's our cost of doing business. So they have to buy the dollars at 5% or, you know, 5% interest. They're then selling those dollars or lending them out at seven and a half percent interest. Um, what most people don't know and they don't talk about it often enough is they don't talk about their deposits. The deposits are what matters. And here's why it matters. When you talk to a bank, every dollar you deposit, they can lend out nine. Mm -hmm. It's called fractional banking. So they can lend out $9 for every $1 in deposits you bring in. So when I bring them a project and I show them, Hey guys, it's $8,000 a month. One of the parts of my slide literally says, this allows you eight times nine, 72. It allows you $72,000 more a month of lending. I'm speaking yeah. back. I have yeah, never seen they're any other you, investor. Yeah. Every yeah, other investor they, present that way. And they're paying you 1% and they're charging seven. Not right? even one. On a much literally, bigger, yeah. yeah. Literally a 10th of 1% is what they're paying in that savings account. However, right. however, right. the idea is, is that, I will bring my deposits into that bank. Right. I'll have my savings somewhere else. Sometimes I'll leave my savings or at least a, you know, a quarter million dollar account with, with a, with a bank yeah. like that. But the big thing is you guys need to talk about your deposits when right. you're doing a project and you're trying to get the loan, tell them we're going to bring all those deposits in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really funny. That, but, but I think I shared this on my channel. I got a call from a bank that has one of my commercial loans basically called me up started whispering sweet nothings like, Hey, we'll give you a better rate, blah, blah, blah. And kind of the punchline was you got to bring a hundred grand. I think it was like 75 grand. Yep. Yeah. You know, Cause we're, we're only doing, you know, preferred lending. Sure. Yep. So again, having those conversations, understanding the banks, especially small banks uh, is, is a great conversation. Every single bank, literally every bank right now, the biggest concern that they have is deposits. Because like. whether they're, they need to be able to lend out, but they also need to be able to cover the crap loans that they have because <laughs> all of them have some of these bad, crappy workout loans that they're working through. Yep. They need to have, in order, if, if they don't have deposits growing, mm -hmm. the challenge that they have is that then they need to start charging more margin on their loans. When they charge more margin on their loans, they get less business. And likely the only person that's out there overpaying for their loan is somebody that shouldn't be getting that loan in the first place. Exactly. Somebody that's definitely more capitally tight, you know, cap tight on capital. So for me, every conversation, I just, I, I got told yes by one of my banks two weeks ago on a deal. Two days later, they yanked my letter. They said, mm -hmm. we're not going to do the deal with you. I was like, it's not a good idea, guys. And yeah. the banker went to the senior lender and said, we can't yank this. This is a really bad idea. He said, I understand he's your top client. We're still yanking the deal. So they killed my deal. They didn't kill my deal. They killed my offer from that bank. Right. I went and I shopped it. And I literally told the other one, because I have another project going on. I shopped my shopped with three or four other banks. And I got a bank that basically reached back out to me and said, we want it. We want all $20,000 a month of deposits that that project's going to bring in when it's done. Yeah. You're like, and we will score. do the deal for, yeah, we'll do the deal for you at seven, four, nice. which is a outrageously cheap rate right now. Yeah. Good for you. Well, let's flip the script to why you're really here. And that is, oh, crap, I'm a landlord. You're the hands-on guy. <laughs> I am. right. Yep. Uh, Olivia and I embarrassingly tried to paint a two-bedroom apartment one time. It was horrible. It had to be redone. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm decently handy, but have no interest in doing anything two and a half hours away. Agreed. Yeah. One sure. way, right? Not yeah. a chance. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you break down, you know, A, why did you do everything yourself? Probably because you had to. And yep. broke. You know, now it's, yeah, you're broke. You're broke. No money. Um, but just talk about that experience and then why you're helping people understand, even if you have a property manager like me, you're helping people how, understand how not to get ripped off. Um, so talk about all that. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you guys can check out the course syllabus that I have, but basically it just talks about how to interact, how to do all the things. You know, I was sitting at the closing table on my first deal um, and on my first, my first real deal, not my very first deal where I like house hacked with a roommate buddy of mine. I, but on my very first deal where it was a real investment property, it was like, this is what I'm doing now. And I literally sat at the table and I said, oh shit, I'm a landlord. Now what? I was like, I don't have an estoppel, which lists the tenants and their phone numbers and 
current on rent. I didn't have any of that stuff. It was just, I, I there were no courses then. Uh, there was nothing available then. There was only like these big, huge, expensive, you know, go to a hotel for three days and spend $5,000. I didn't have that. Didn't have that money. And so for me, it was, I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm completely stuck. I don't know how to find tenants. I don't know how to do anything. And so I just tried to put myself in that beginner's shoes and say, okay, I lived it. What are all the things that I needed then that I've built over the last 20 years that make managing my business more fun, but also far more profitable. Um, I know what something should cost when somebody gives me a quote and they say, yeah, to sheetrock that job, it's going to be 30,000 bucks. I can go, sure. How many sheets? And they're like, what? I'm like, how many sheets? Like, uh, 225 sheets, $30,000 for 225 sheets. That's a cute number. Hmm. I was like, why are we charging 140 a sheet? And instantly you're talking contractor with them. And they're like, well, I think we could work on that number. Oh, you think we could work on that number. And that's the thing is they, you know, contractors are not in, all of them are not inherently dishonest. All of them are not that way. So I don't want you guys thinking that, but they will price things just like anybody else will, which is here's what the number is. And then they're probably willing to work with you if you can have a, the right conversation with them. I get thousands of dollars knocked off my projects all the time because I have them walk me through it. And I'm like, listen, I want you to make money. I get it. You just can't hit a home run off of me or a triple off of me. I'm going to be one of your single double guys. I'm going to keep on giving you work. We're going to keep on doing projects because I'm going to keep on expanding. But here's how we have to do things. Here's, here's, where, here's what's fair. So we negotiate rates, we negotiate price per sheet, we negotiate, you know, painting and how that works, who buys the painting. You know, they're like, well, we'll buy all the materials. You can open up a trust, which you should have your properties in at least a trust or an LLC, either one. But if you have them in a trust, you still have an EIN number. And that EIN number can be your social, it can be the EIN of the actual trust itself. But then you can buy everything at, at, at a contractor price, which might be 10 or 20% off. So not only are you getting 10 or 20% off of retail, but you're not paying them 10% to carry your cost. Why would you want to do that? So you can save 20, 30 points uh, percent on even materials. So that's where the course came from was I wanted to help people. My projects now, uh, inflation adjusted, my projects now cost me a whole lot less than they did years ago because I know all the ins and outs. I know how to speak construction and I'm not a construction guy. I, I just learned the trade and understood how deals were negotiated. And you don't want to be the person that's just like, you can do it for less. You can do it for less. You can do it because you're going to find your level. You're going to find bad contractors that way. You want to find good tron contractors with good uh, that they can count on you. Like as soon as my stuff passes inspection, I show up to the inspection with my checkbook, with the contractor, when the inspector walks us through and he goes, nope, I think we're all good. Just change that one thing or fix that one one or two things. That guy I said, fix those now. We'll take a picture of them. We'll send them an email to the inspector. I'll pay you. It's just that simple. I pay yeah. right away. And they don't, yeah. it's not this net 30 stuff. Most, plenty of contractors get burned. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the big things I've done my whole career for, for big jobs. Anything at the, in the beginning, anything over a thousand bucks now, a couple of grand is, Pay upon delivery, right? Once yep. it passes inspection, yep. it just get, it just you jump to the line, and then when you have a storm or you have something else, you get a little you get a little love. You you get yeah. to go first, right? Sure. It's, it's it's a people business, as we keep reminding folks. Absolutely. What one of the big things I want to do before we go to questions? Remember, folks, you're going to get to ask your burning desired questions of the lumberjack in a minute. So raise your hand. I want to go through the big items, Matt. Yeah, and just help people understand rough costs. Now, these are obviously rough, rough costs for you, Yep. but I think it's important because one of the things they're doing on their spreadsheet is make ready, right? And yep. What I call an A is zero. It's turned, it's ready. B is, you know, paint and carpet. C is kind of full gut. And one of the things I, I want people to remember, I think this was, gosh, this might've been 18 months ago. I told you yep. about a one of my apartment buildings. I was putting on a massive roof. Yeah. Like 66 square, I think it was. Yeah. You, you asked yeah. me, you know, how big? I had the quote in front of me. I told you, you, you quoted it within like 200 bucks. Yeah. It was, Close. it was, I mean, I was shocked. 
It also made me feel better that I got a great deal, but that was, that's a different story. <laughs> um, but let's walk through a house real quick. Let's make it a house. Sure. Um, let's assume it's 1,500 square feet, just so we kind sure. of level set. Um, yep. Painting an exterior of a house, uh, let's say, you know, two different colors, right? The base color and the trim. Mm -hmm. What's a what's a kind of rough number you would kind of just ballpark for folks? Yeah, usually you're about six bucks um, for a, for a decent painter. Usually you're about six bucks a square foot. Okay. Um, on the inside, on the outside, um, because on the inside you have to do trim. Uh, you know, you have to do your your doors. You have to do your baseboard. You have to do all that stuff. So usually inside, uh, six bucks. I mean, again, test your market. But right. when they come back at six bucks, these are the numbers that I carry when I walk through a property. So I walk through a property and I'm like, okay, the building is 3,200 square feet. It's going to cost me, you know, at the high end retail, it's going to cost me 18 grand or, or, or 19, 19, uh, two, um, somewhere around there. And then, and then I know that my number is probably closer to four, four bucks a okay. square foot. All so right. that way I know, okay, this job is going to cost me about 12, 12, 13,000 bucks. Um, the other key too is, is that when you're quoting, when you're, when you're getting the quote from them, say, I just need to understand how much material because I already have a contract with Sherwin Williams or Benjamin Moore or whomever, uh, and I'll buy the product for you. Just tell me so what you're it is. just labor. Yep. Just you're labor. just labor, which means for them now it's your responsibility to get the product to the site. But yep. most of these places offer a delivery. Yep. So just make sure. And that way you have, you can have a literally a handyman check up and make sure, Hey, did the paint get delivered today? Hey, did the lumber get delivered today? Hey, did the trim get delivered today? Et cetera. Okay. Um, so yeah, so on painting, yeah, you're looking at, you know, four to six bucks a foot, depending on, uh, depending on what you can negotiate. And that obviously doesn't, you know, take into account, you know, busted up walls and drywall repairs and, you know, just, just basic stuff. Yep. If you're going to do the outside, are you like four or five bucks a square foot? Yeah, you're, you you're about? probably, yeah, you're probably about, yeah. And it, you could be three to four. Um, because again, that, that job can be a whole lot easier because they can yeah, just plastic bigger, off, the, it, they can plastic yeah. off the windows and then they just spray the entire thing and then they go back and they cut in white. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So okay. yeah, let's go to flooring. Um, yep. you know, you want to put carpet in the bedroom. What are you thinking? Why? <laughs> well, it's, 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 no carpet in the bedroom, Michael. No, okay, we don't, so we, we don't do any carpet anywhere, only on the stairs and we use eight pound pad. Because what you'll find is if you ever go to court, the judge will say, well, the carpet's five years old. It's basically reached its life expectancy. It's on you. They actually give carpet a life expectancy of five to seven years. So very often, if you end up going to court or evicting somebody, and quite frankly, if they had pets, it's largely speaking, carpet's a bad idea. So we always use LVP. Our LVP Good. price is usually about 250 a foot, mm -hmm. uh, a square foot. And then we can expect to pay between, depending on what we need for an underlayment. Sometimes we want to go with like a cushiony cork. Others were trying to reduce uh, noise. Um, others were just saying, hey, based on what the subfloor is, it might be concrete. We're going to use a different kind of uh, non-antimicrobial so we don't end up with mold if there's any moisture and things like that. So you could be 50 cents to a square foot uh, based on what you're going to do for flooring. Um, and then installation. Uh, you can find people that are willing to charge you as more, much as three or four bucks a square foot. Um, and you can also find crews that will show up in a van. It's usually uh, Vietnamese crews is what I found in our area that will show up and they'll bang it out. They'll start at eight in the morning. They'll go until 10 o'clock at night, but you're done. Right. And then they end up, they end up being around a buck 75 a foot. So you see the difference in size. Now, is there going to be something that you're going to have to have your handyman, two or three things, four things, the handyman has to go back and repair? Yeah, probably it probably, but at that buck a foot or two bucks a foot savings, the handyman's really cheap compared to paying for the guy that does a perfect job on the front side. Right. There's usually okay. two or three small issues that I can fix. Uh, how about windows? A lot of older homes, uh, at yeah. least in my area need new windows. What do you, what do you pay for windows? And yeah, windows, 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 you're usually looking for, uh, you know, about a hundred bucks a window for install, but then you're looking at another you know, hundred, little over a hundred when you want to trim that window out. And then it's just the cost of the window. And that can vary from a, you know, a, um, a $99 special all the way up to a, um, you know, what's called an STC rated window, which is you start at a hundred decibels. It's minus 35 decibels. So it's only 65 decibels, which means it's a hundred decibels outside is only 65 inside and a hundred is pretty loud. So if you're in a high traffic area, double yellow line, 
Um, there's a lot of construction around you, i.e. like a dumpster company or something like that. Um, you want to go with a higher end window and that window might cost you six, seven, 800 bucks. Um, but you can get a normal standard window, which is an energy star window. Um, you can get something that is uh, what's called argon gas energy star. Um, and that's kind of your base window that you want to use. Don't use the cheap cheapies, but those will run you. Mm, they're semi, they're basically custom windows, but you can find a local yard that builds them as opposed to like a Pella or an Anderson. Um, if you do Pella or Anderson, take the time, multiply it times two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long, long lag. Yeah. Long, long lag and big dollars. They're paying for all that advertising that we see for all those ads. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. How about doors, right? There's obviously a difference between interior and exterior doors. What do you, what do you got after doors? I like Thermatru doors. We use them almost exclusively on the outside of our stuff. Um, they run between five and 600 bucks in standard sizes. You can get a nice stylish door. Um, it's not metal. It's actually a composite. It's a nice door, easy to clean, easy to paint. Um, it'll last probably 50 years. Um, those range depending on size between five and 700 bucks. Um, you can get those at a lumber yard. You can also get them at a big box store, but I like them at a lumber yard better. Um, and then interior doors, just pick a style and stick with it. So yeah. we use something called a craftsman three. Um, we know that door costs us between 280 and 350 bucks, depending on the size. And that's the only door that we put in everywhere. So we've deployed 200 of those doors and we probably have another 200 to go, but that's a solid core door. If you're going to punch my door, I want your hand to hurt. Yeah. So solid core. Yeah. That solid core is going to likely break a knuckle, break a finger, at least leave you with a bruise where you're like, man, did I hit something? Yeah. I punched yeah. the door. Yeah. Yeah. Idiot. Stop. Yeah. Stop punching my <laughs> doors. If you want to punch um, my stuff, it's going to hurt. Yeah. So let's go to the bathroom, right? You're buying a lot of stuff. Uh, so you go to a bathroom. It's got to be a full gut. What are you, what are you looking at doing? Let's assume single sink, uh, yeah. full bath, shower combo. What are you doing in there? Yeah, vanities two to five hundred bucks. Uh, toilet we use a we use a, a Viper two toilet. Um, that Viper two toilet is phenomenal. They rarely get clogged, um, and they're reasonably priced. They perform. Yes, I'm talking about toilet performance. They perform about as well as a five hundred dollar Kohler or six hundred dollar Kohler. Um, and they have a version where you can get the round front or the elongated front, and that differs when you have space. So when you're looking at a bathroom, usually you're looking at that, that toilet costing you 300 bucks, the vanity costing, you know, three to 500. Um, the mistake that most people make is they put in new tub surrounds or they do those horrible bath fittings. Don't ever do that stuff. That is outrageously overpriced and too expensive and it doesn't really solve the problem. So we do a lot of bathrooms where we'll actually have the, the old bathtub. Uh, we'll have it sanded and reglazed. And that usually is, 800 to a thousand bucks a plumber to pop that out and put in a new one is about three. So it's about a third, the price. And then as far as surrounds go, you can go with a plastic surround depending on the quality of the unit, but that plastic surround could cost you 800 to a thousand bucks and you can likely get it tiled for less than two. Yeah. So those are the little things where it's like, then you're instantly taking your property up a notch. That's not the difference of it renting or not. That's the difference of it renting first or not right. compared to its competition. Okay. So yeah, so, so, so a bath, and then I would change out while you're doing all that work, I would change out something called the mixing valve, which is what's, uh, which is what actually mixes the water in the shower. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I go, I like me personally, I like Delta and Kohler. Those are the two better brands um, okay. for mixing valves um, and those products. And so you're probably 300 bucks, 400 bucks for a nice setup that looks good. So all in a new bathroom, you're about five grand. I can do a grand? bathroom for less than five grand. Most people, it costs them 10. All right. So we'll, we'll call it five. And yep. now let's go into the kitchen, right? You're going into the kitchen. Let's yeah. assume, let's assume you're painting the cabinets. You're maybe changing doors and hardware, you're changing the countertop. But go ahead. Yeah. I hate that idea. But All yes. right, well, you tell us what you do. You go to a kitchen. What do you do? <laughs> no, I think that Mike's exactly right, though. So in, in some cases, depending on what the quality of the unit is or depending on the class of the unit, it might make only sense to paint them. That's yeah. So I mean, I got to tell you, at least maybe it's a California thing. A lot of the boxes of the units I buy are solid. Yeah, they're custom they're made. Certainly better than I could 
buy today off the shelf. So that's why yep. I'm usually replacing doors, painting and moving on. So, so curious, anyway. Mike. So, uh, and not to put you on the spot, but in that's a typical good. kitchen, yep. what are you spending to paint, redo doors and handles and, and hinges? Well, I've never seen a breakdown of just that, but I would guess that's probably 2,200 to 26, I would guess. Yep. Somewhere and so, so I, because I'm broken, opened up yeah, yeah. a cabinet franchise so I can wholesale <laughs> to the public. So I the remember. people in my lumberjack course, they actually get to buy wholesale cabinets. And so I'm doing kitchens for three grand. Me Okay. When you Brand say new. A kitchen. boxes, so okay. boxes, so all the uppers, all the lowers, we have a special design that I did, which actually saves 1600 bucks in a normal kitchen, which is a butcher block countertop and a farmer's sink. It's a different look than all of your competition is going to have, but, and it looks more expensive. It saves you 1600 bucks. All right. And so those are the kitchens that we put in. So I do, um, I do kitchens for 5,000 bucks and no company you no. can, you walk into and you're going to get a quote for 10 to 12 or $15,000. Yeah. I think kitchens in my apartments are 7,500 to eight grand yep. and they're, you know, they're, yeah. Not, not we can do kitchen. yeah we can do them for and we can do them for five you know because yeah. we're doing the we're doing the cabinets of wholesale and these are these are solid wood cabinets okay they're they're high quality they're slow closed doors slow closed drawers um you know they they are they are not cheap the uh, to give you an idea these are the same cabinets that i put in a eight hundred thousand dollar house i did mm. okay for me i like it I love the cabinets. They're awesome. Uh, and I guess the only other things to talk about are the outside. I don't know what you, you know, for me in California, fit, you know, landscaping, fencing, fences are a big deal out yeah. here. They, you know, the sun beats them up. Uh, yep. What do you got out there? So fences, usually you can find, you know, the big thing is, is calling dig safe. You know, I'm not what the, yeah. what the version of that is where you guys, but if you call dig safe and you see there's no lines and it's a pretty easy thing, then you can easily hire just like a labor crew and they can measure out eight feet between. And then you're looking at about 130 a panel uh, for the, your typical PVC. I like the PVC stuff because it'll last forever. But the PVC in the sleeve, if you figure about 200 bucks for every eight feet, you're going to be in pretty good shape. And then you just figure, because uh, that's going to count your two by four or your four by four, excuse me. That'll count your four by four. That'll count the panel. That'll count the cement that you need after you auger the ground and pour it. So if you figure about 200 bucks for every eight feet and then just figure out what labor is, usually guys that do that stuff, they can do eight, 10, 12 panels in a day. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Right. If, if it's a crew of three. Very, very cool. Um, any, again, folks, you're going to get to ask questions. We're right around the corner from this. Gina's going to be first. She's the only one with her hand up. Come on. Can send you open, raise their hand. So I'm ready to oh. answer their question as well. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. But any other thoughts as we wrap this up, you're the hands-on guy. Yeah. Uh, any things we've missed uh, before we get to the question? It really, it really comes down to understanding what some of the things should cost, understanding what your market is, understanding, having processes in place. Mike's buy box is brilliant. And when you couple that with my rent box on top of that, it guarantees that you won't do a bad deal. If you do buy box and rent box, you won't do a bad deal. That's how powerful those, those two ideas are. Um, but yeah, when it comes to managing your property, I think it's really important because, you know, Mike does that job of getting f people to, to make, take the plunge and buy something. The key is, is that you're going to own that asset for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Yeah. So if you manage it, like I manage my assets, they actually go up, your rents go up, you stay in front of the market those processes become critical to making sure that you're optimizing your portfolio because it's a whole lot easier 10 years in to have done half as many projects, but get twice as much yield or, or, or rot return on capital out of them than it is to have to buy twice as much and not manage them properly. And then where are you? You know, you're likely at that point, if you have to sell something, you're going to have to sell something and take a hit for the projects that you didn't do because you weren't charging enough rent. Um, so really my process lends itself very well to sustainability and growth. And so I have stuff that I've owned for 10 and 15 years now that, um, most of my early stuff is gone, but the stuff that I've owned for 10 or 15 years now, you know, I make 
twice what the mortgage is on it. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you can't make up for longevity. And so everybody, a lot of people that have looked good in the last three years that aren't going to look good in the next three. So the idea is you really have to build a sustainability in your portfolio. And the way that you do that is by managing and controlling costs. Well, again, you've heard me say this, but we'll say for the audience that's seeing this for the first time, the good operators are going to be the winners, right? The financial engineers, the people that got lucky on timing, they're all going to get hurt. Yep. Some of them are going to go to jail. Um, <laughs> that's so that's, that's, that's where we are. Well, we're going to get to Q&A now. Thank you for being patient, folks. Uh, Gina, uh, on my screen, you are the first hand raised and uh, Senya, you'll be next. But Gina, go ahead. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Hi, Gina. Um, hello. I question about the 203K loans that you were sure. talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so can you have an FHA loan? So if, say if I'm house hacking uh, duplex, I had an FHA loan. I've lived there for two years, three years. And now I want to acquire another property. Mm -hmm. Can you have a 203K loan with an FHA loan at the same time? So you can, so FHA, it can be, F, it's an FHA program. So it's FHA 203K. What I would probably do, Gina, is if you're, okay. living in, if you're living in your place now and you've got like a three rate, three and a half, four, something like that, some great rate on the place you're living in now, mm -hmm. I wouldn't give that mm -hmm. up. I'd be looking at the conventional version of that 203K. And when you talk to any okay. mortgage broker, any bank, they'll say, hey, yeah, we have a construction option or we have a rehab option. Um, and use that in conjunction. And that's basically getting a conventional loan set up like that. I wouldn't be giving up anything that I financed in the last two or three years. Wouldn't be giving up any of that stuff. I wouldn't want to keep that because yeah. that keeps the debt, the long term really yeah. cheap. So that's your best bet in my eyes. Yeah. Okay. So you can, you can keep the FHA property and then get another, but conventional 203K. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I would, um, Mike has a great <laughs> guest with uh, Matt, the mortgage guy. He has a great guest. And so Matt, I've, I brought Matt a number of clients and just said, he's, he's like, they're not my state, but I, I have, we have a U mortgage presence somewhere else. And then he's linked them up. And most importantly is they manage and operate the same way. So I've, I've enjoyed all the work that I've done with, with his crew. They've been great. Yeah, me too. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Welcome. All right, Gina, any follow-up? You're good to go. I'm good to go. Thanks. Awesome. awesome. Very cool. Senya, you're up. Okay. All right. Good Hi. morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming by uh, to share your knowledge with us. Sure. Um, so I have a question. Two questions, mm -hmm. actually. Sure. Uh, first one, um, every real estate agent I speak to uh, tells me that uh, during the sessions, right, uh, homeowners uh, lose their homes and um, create a larger tenant pool, which makes sense, right? So mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear your take on it, especially that you sh you shared with us like a little uh, different experience, right? Mm -hmm. When you actually lost paying tenants during a 2008 crisis. So just wanted to hear your take. Why is there such a disconnect? Um, I would, I would venture to say as kindly as I can say it, those agents probably don't own any investment property and they're only speaking on, on feelings. They didn't actually experience it. They don't actually know what ended up happening in 08 was rents in some areas did go up because people were losing their homes. They were leaving their homes. Any, any realtor that believes that now doesn't, hasn't worked with a bank on a high enough level where they understand how banks operate. Banks do not want to take back those homes. Banks absolutely do. They are going to be doing workouts, 40 year mortgages. They have a number of other options that they can do for folks. Last time they recognized that was the biggest issue that they had was taking these things back because they would take something back that was $250,000 was owed on it. And they were getting 120,000 bucks when they sold it. And so the bank was having to write down 130 grand. That's why all the banks got in so much trouble. And so this time around, there's going to be people that it's going to be posted on auction sites. It's going to be saying it's in default and going into foreclosure. They're working things out with them. It's just like when you post mm -hmm. papers on a tenant, you're still trying to work with them to get something resolved. And some of them end up in eviction. Some of them end up with them leaving. So I think you're still going to see foreclosures. I think you'll still see, I don't think you'll see any short sales because everybody that owns anything, it's worth a lot more than what they paid for it. 
So I think largely speaking, um, realtors give out fairly bad advice that aren't investors. If they're an investor, then there might be some nuance to that market, but a majority of them, 93% or 95% of agents don't own any investment property. And about 30% of agents don't even own a home. Mm. Like I don't, you, you should never take diet advice from me. And you should never take advice like that from a renter when they don't understand how all the inner workings work. Does that help? So, yes, for sure. Awesome. So, um, a better way to, I guess, protect yourself um, against, you know, recession when sure. and if it may come, I uh, would be Section Eight housing, right? So, I think diversification in that way is important. Um, I think that I I like Section Eight housing for what it is. Um, but the challenge that you have with section eight housing is, and these are just my numbers, but they're factual. I have an 800% higher likelihood of getting a maintenance call from a section eight unit than I do from a regular unit. Eight X costs me more to manage those units. And the funny thing is they pay less than the market does. So I think it's important to have a percentage of them, but the better percentages, the percentages I like more are students. I like student housing more than I like section eight because they get their uh, school loans and their school loans cover housing. I like fixed income better than that. Than that. I like military better than section eight because uh, you can call an XO who is basically the commanding officer or the senior officer in charge. And for any of you who are uh, armed forces, I apologize. I don't know exact definition but you can actually report them as not having paid their rent and they know that. So they're going to stay up on it. The other piece too is, is that if somebody has a 720 or a 750 credit score, they are far more likely to pay because they can't afford to lose that 720 or that 750 credit because that's their ability to borrow. That's their ability to buy. And so people really start to protect that. And if they go into it with a 620 anyway, then they have no problem being a 520 or a 480. You know, they've been there. If they're at 620, they've been at 580 before or 520 or 480. Um, I literally saw a credit score this week of 392. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that's possible. I actually asked the person, I said, so I have to ask, are, do you get like an allergic reaction when you go to pay your bills? 392. It's a 392. Like, you know, we should probably have Bill Narcan waiting, standing by. Like, it's absurd. And I said, how could I ever consider you? She's like, well, you know, I just, I, I've, I've been going through some things. I was like, that's fine, but you're going to have to continue to go through those things. That's not on me to take on. And all of her stuff was still actively in collections. Right. I'm like, yeah. Let me, ask you, let me ask you a question about section eight. Cause you've only been doing section eight for three years. Comparison's sake. Yep, shorter three years. Than me. Yeah. Way, uh, way shorter. Yeah. How have you seen turnover? Have you seen turnover for section eight be less than cash payers? Um, or is it too soon? No. To it's, it's well, so in the three years, the section eight people that we've wanted to get rid of, we've gotten rid of them, um, okay. which has been That's about, fine. it's been about what it's been about 20%. Mm. It's been about 20% of the section eight tenants that we've gotten. We're like, no, mm -mm, no, we're not renewing. And we knew yeah. that pretty quickly. And in fact, sure. two or three times we've actually asked them to leave early. Yeah. We're just like, Hey, this isn't working out. We've called the housing authority. We're just like, this isn't working out. This isn't going to work out long-term. Right. Um, and so um, from a market perspective, um, the thing that that's where we instituted um, a, a lot of the evictions that we've done were not tenants that we picked. They were tenants. Right. We inherited. You inherited. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What I would tell you about Section 8, having had Section 8 tenants for 22 years now, once they're in houses, they almost never leave. My experience. I'm talking eight, nine, 10 years. Section 8 in apartments little bit more turnover, right? Because their goal, not speaking for them, but based on experiences, they want to go from the apartment to the house. Once Section 8's in house, my experience, they stay for, you know, seemingly a long time. Yeah, I think um, we've seen it range. Um, you know, we've, but we've had, um, like I said, it's just a higher hit rate of issues. Okay. It's just been for us. And so uh, I, I didn't have a handyman I did almost all my own stuff and right. now I have to have one because right. they also are the first ones to call code enforcement. They're the sure. first ones to call housing. 
And it's not on big issues. We got them calling, well, a piece of my backsplash fell off. Okay. Like no one died and no one's at risk of death. A piece of backsplash fell off. Yeah. You know? Okay. Gotcha. Senya, do you have a follow-up question? Um, I have another question. Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, should be quick. Um, mm -hmm. How do you find real estate for sailors? Like I did a little oh. search online and I didn't find much. Maybe I didn't. Yeah. So I would look at, so great question. So we, um, for me, it is, I've, I talk to everybody. So I talk to new agents all the time. I'm just like, Oh, Hey, do you know any wholesalers? Um, I also get those, um, cards in the mail where they're trying to buy my properties. And there are tons of those. And those are almost all wholesalers. So the cards in the mail that you get, you can also talk to other landlords and landlord groups there. They've likely bought from other wholesalers. You can also, cause a lot of them aren't big enough businesses. They're like smaller guys who wholesale. Um, and so you can look up on Facebook. Um, that's what I've done. Facebook groups. There's actual wholesale Facebook groups. And you're like, Hey, I'm looking for wholesalers in this area. Yeah. Um, so you can do that. Think. That's what I've, I've done all of those things. And I've got probably eight or 10. Yeah. I think there's two ways to find wholesalers. And again, they're, your, your job will be vetting the good ones versus the bad ones because it's easy to call yourself a wholesaler, Senya. Yeah. So I would do the Facebook thing. Uh, I would also, what, where I think you get a lot more traction is a local RIA, real estate meetup. Yep. You know, usually at those meetups, they'll, you know, at the beginning or the end, usually the beginning, they'll say, anybody looking for anything? I would just stand up and say, hey, I'm a new investor. Here's my buy box. I'm looking to meet three new wholesalers today. You know, hopefully they're in the room and I think you'd be swarmed. Yeah. Yep. They're, they're not hard to find, right? Especially right now. The challenge is, is that it's not to believe that every wholesaler that brings you a deal is a good deal. Oh yeah. They're, There's I, plenty I, of bad deals in those wholesale buckets. I have this I one say, owner yeah. around us that has put his deals under contract nine times in the last <laughs> two years with nine different wholesalers. Yeah. They can't sell. Yeah. They can't sell because what they're asking is for way too much. Yeah. Very cool. You good, Senya? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Very cool. Karen C you're up next. And what we'll do folks is we'll do three questions, Max. And then we'll, if you want to ask some more, we'll just go to the back of the line. So everybody gets the same love. So three questions each Karen. Hey man, I have two questions for you. One is yes. you said corridors, but was there any type of specific door? I missed that. So just solid core. So it doesn't matter whatever design you like to pick. We like something called a craftsman three. It's a very timeless look. It's very classic here in new England. You can walk into an old home. You can find a door that looks just like it, whether it's a 120 year old door or a new door. So we like solid core because that means that it's not hollow. That means it's full wood throughout. And it usually has some sort of a masonite finish, which is easy to paint. Mm -hmm. uh, but we like the craftsman three style. Um, and that's, that's what we deploy. So we deploy solid core craftsman threes throughout our properties. Okay. My second question, and I asked, um, I asked Dion this last week as well is what do you use to run someone's credit? Um, it really, so for us, I don't run credit. I actually have them send me a screenshot of their credit karma. Okay. So I get 200 to 300%. This is one of the things I teach in my course is I get two to 300% more opportunities to rent my units than most landlords because of how I write my ads, but also the criteria and barrier of entry that I create for them. I'm not trying to get them to pay me 50 bucks for an application to talk to me, you know? And so I get kind of a couple criteria up front, which is I want a screenshot of your credit score and I want a screenshot of your last paycheck. Can I ask what your credit limit is? 650. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. 650. That's lower than I would have guessed. I bumped it down only because we have, um, in one of the towns that we, that we do, um, they are about 61% renters mm, okay. in that town. And so the challenge that they have is that they don't, they've never had a mortgage payment that gets reported. So the only thing that they have is consumer debt and cars. Right. And yeah, because yeah. of health, where we're, yeah, because of yeah. where we're headed, yeah. everybody's tightening up on how they're grading and scoring DTI. And okay. so everyone's getting worse scores. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just due to debt load because they haven't adjusted for how much debt load everyone's carrying. All right. Very cool. Karen, was that your two questions? Yep. Awesome. 
Awesome. Uh, Amy, you're up. Hi, Matt. Um, thank hey. you for coming to talk to us. Sure. Um, so I started house hacking um, my first house ever last year. Um, mm -hmm. And so I rent out the extra bedrooms in my unit. So it's just a condo. Mm -hmm. um, and then my roommate is moving out next month. So it's going to be my first turnover. Okay. Um, and I was wondering if you can walk through like the steps of turning over like a room. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently finding um, roommates mm -hmm. and I mainly use um, Facebook, like on Marketplace and then Love all it. the various like Facebook groups. Um, and then my friend, I asked to put it on their company Slack channel. So I am in the process of finding a roommate. But besides that, I was wondering, yeah, if you could walk through like the steps of um, yeah, how to how to process them to move out. Um, I like when they moved in, I had them like mark up a, like a move in checklist to like mm -hmm. prove like everything's working properly. So sure. I was going to have her fill that out. But yep. I wasn't sure if she fills that out like the day she moves out or she does like when the day yep. she moves out. Okay. Day she moves um, out that way. If she whacks a wall with a mattress box spring, uh, uh -huh. you know, uh, um, frame and uh -huh. she puts a dent in there and you got to fix it that way. Uh -huh. you cover it. So it's the only time that that can happen is you have to do it after they've got everything out. Once uh -huh. you get everything out, then we go through the list and walk through it again. That way there's no debate. Yeah. Okay. That, that make yeah, that makes sense. What I would um, do too is just as a, mm -hmm. like a psychological thing, I would have mm -hmm. it on a clipboard and I would have the original one she filled out underneath the new one. Oh yeah. 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 I have the original one. Yeah. Yeah. That was going to show to her. I would just put and, it right there on the clipboard behind it. That way you can always flip it up and reference it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so when I was like doing showings, I noticed that, um, her, like she punched some holes in the wall for like like earthquake proofing her furnitures which is totally fine mm -hmm. but um so that's one thing that I'm like okay that I need to fix when she moves out so I wasn't sure if that's something easy enough for me to do or I should have a handyman do it for me um and also like if that's something that I could deduct from her deductible uh yes yes and yes so yes it's easy enough for you to do um, you can absolutely Google it because it's probably just holes in sheetrock, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, just holes uh -huh. in sheetrock. What, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, sheet it's rock, a wall, right? There's a it's wall. A, yeah. It's a wall covering. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's just sheetrock. So sheet rock, yeah. You, yeah, you can definitely. And is it like uh, this big, like two inches by two inches? No, it's just like a screw, screwdriver. Oh, so it's, it's just, just a, like, oh yeah, that's cool. really yeah. easy. Even yeah, I can easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, you can there's a there's a million videos online, super easy repair. Um they they call it 40 minute mud. You can walk right into Home Depot and you can buy 40 minute mud. Uh you can buy it pre-mixed. Uh so then it's really just about taking a spatula and then you can look online to see techniques of, you know, how you pull it, you know, pull it out and slather on the wall and how big the slather should be and you can absolutely do that stuff. It's not a problem. And then the only thing that I would do there is if you're going to, you know, in entering into any roommate contract or anything like that, what I find is easiest that way, if you go to court and the judge says, yeah, but you, you did the work. Well, yeah, but I charge 35 bucks an hour for my time. The judge can go, there's nowhere contracted that you can charge that. Mm -hmm. And so you typically should have that in the roommate agreement that says, Hey, anything that I can repair, mm -hmm. I will repair at this rate plus materials. Okay. So I should let her know that this month before she moves out, if I do decide to do it myself. Mm -hmm. like well, I, mean, it, either, I mean, either way you can say, you know, it's going to, it's going to save. So you wouldn't be able to double dip. So as an example, if you do the job and you hate the job you did, you right. can't charge her for that and charge mm -hmm. her for the, summit, right. for the person well, that comes in behind mm -hmm. to do a Matt, good job. Matt, quick question. Yeah, quick question. Uh, the other thing she could do is it could be up to the tenant to repair, right? She could say, hey, I've noticed that you earthquaked your dresser or TV or whatever. Um, you know, do you plan to repair that before you leave? Because as you know, when you moved in, that hole didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So not knowing the tenant's capabilities, it's possible that the tenant could repair that as well. Yeah, you could. I mean, that's one of the things that I used to have read in my lease, which was you need to have something professionally repaired. 
you know? Mm-hmm. And so that way, that way they're not like, well, I went around and I filled all that stuff. And you're like, it looks awful. What do you mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course you're going to have to pay to do that the right way. So, you know, we, I obviously, you know, having contractors that were friends of mine that live with me, I, I wasn't a stickler about it. I was just like, no, I mean, you're a contractor. I'm not going to make you buy to have somebody else do it. Like you can do it, but I expect, I expect the job I saw three weeks ago, not the one I saw three months ago, you mm-hmm. know, so quality mm-hmm. of work, but yeah, that's what I would do. I, I would, I would just let her know, Hey, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to, you know, get somebody to do that. However, if I do it, I'm, you know, just going right. to, you know, again, that's where I have that in the roommate agreement. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they know what the cost is going to be up front. Now, if you don't have that in the roommate agreement, mm-hmm. it'd be tough to sue them and get recovery. You know, that, that in that particular case, you'd actually have to hire somebody to do mm-hmm. the work to then give her the invoice to say it was done by a pro. So if you add that piece about, you know, I had the right to repair at, you know, and at 30 bucks an hour or something like that, you just have to have a roommate agreement before somebody signs. Can't okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we already, we, that, that wasn't in my, our lease. I didn't think so. Agreement. It's not, but next time. Next it's time. not in most. I'm saying next time it's a good thing mm-hmm. to have in there. You know? Okay. So I should. If I could, I should try to do it myself and just let her know or ask her if she wants. I, to I, I think, fix. Amy, the first step is to ask her if she intends yeah. to repair those before she uh-huh. leaves to pay someone to repair them, yes. uh-huh. unless she's a contractor, because maybe she's planning to pay it or maybe she doesn't even know. Yeah. But, you know, those all those holes didn't exist. So sometimes right. it's just communication. Uh huh. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll point it out to her and see if she can fix it. And if not, I'll just tell her. Yeah. like okay. how much it would be to fix it yeah. if I did it myself. Yeah, because yeah. we have a pretty good relationship, so I don't yeah. think there's going to be any contentious situation. Yeah, you, you've got to that. put it back to the condition it was when she moved in. Those holes didn't exist. The mm-hmm. next person has a choice. I mean, it, it should be a reasonable mm-hmm. conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And so, uh. yeah, okay, thank you for answering that. And then sure. besides that, is there any any other steps in the move out process that I should do in any order um, besides those things? I don't think so. I think really the big thing is, is, you know, making sure that there's agreement of what the unit needs to be essentially for, you know, her to get her deposit back. Um, where are you located? What state? Um, in California in okay. the Bay area. So, okay. there, so I don't know what the rules are as far as deposit returns, mm-hmm. Mike, what are those? I don't, well, I, I think, think I have 30, a- day, 30 days. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, I think, yeah. yeah, but you know, going, it's a friend, it's a roommate, you know, assuming she's working with you. I mean, I'm not opposed to, to giving it up. You know, certainly if it was a roommate situation, having the money available that day yep. or next day. Um, yep. But yeah, I think you have 30 days. Yeah. The only reason I ask mm-hmm. is because if you hire somebody to do that work, you can't just give the right. security deposit back until after the work is done and you have an invoice. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So just make sure that that's being done in a timely manner. Cause that, that um, as soon as it goes over 30 days, it's triple damages. Yeah. So, not good. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's not triple damages on the, it can be on the entire deposit. So if you don't return that entire deposit mm-hmm. within 30 days, they can take you to court and it's open and shut. They're just like, I didn't oh. get my deposit. Mm-hmm. It wasn't postmarked within 30 days of my moving out. Wait, I have to pay them three times the deposit. Is that what you mean? Oh, so triple, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If triple you damages. Didn't return it. Yeah. If you didn't triple. return it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. If okay. you didn't return it. Um, that's where okay. a lot of new landlords get got there because they don't know that rule. And so they're just mm-hmm. like, well, I was waiting on somebody's bill or I was waiting on this. Mm-hmm. You have to make sure mm-hmm. that it goes out within 30 days. And then it's an itemized list of everything that you did and the cost associated with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anything that you deduct, make sure there's a line item. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um. Last question. So um, I was thinking of deep cleaning the carpet mm-hmm. after, after she moves out. So Mm-hmm. Would that be considered like a wear and tear or should I also deduct that from the deposit? Did you do that before she moved in? Mm-hmm. Well, it was brand new carpets. So not not really, but it was brand new carpet. Yeah. How long has she lived there? A year and a half. A, like a year and yeah, almost a year and a half. Yeah. I don't know, Matt. What do you think? I would I would I would have it cleaned. I would have it cleaned in charge. I would have it cleaned and probably not charged, frankly. Yeah. I mean, if it's, you got to be really careful as a landlord, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, right? There's just normal wear and tear. They've paid you rent for 18 months. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be walking on your carpet. Yeah. It's not like they broke the rules and had a dog or a cat or a rabbit living in there. uh That's a totally different situation. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as a dirty carpet and wanting to make it look good for the next tenant, Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I would absolutely deep clean it. But unless there was something like she, I don't know, kept food under a bed or something crazy. Mm. Yeah. I would not charge for the deep I'd, cleaning personally. I'd put that in your roommate agreement that, that, Hey, when I'm, you're, you're getting it perfectly uh -huh. cleaned and professionally cleaned uh, when you leave, you I need you to okay. professionally clean it. So go. that's the same thing we do in ours. We, may, you know, so the few units that we have that have carpet, um, you know, we basically say, Hey, we had it professionally clean before you moved in. So when you leave, we need a receipt of it being professionally clean. Mm -hmm. Okay. You had yeah. somebody trying to give us a receipt for a company that didn't exist. Yeah. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, that like, would be difficult for me to have yeah. to you handle yeah. that. Okay. Since I think probably for the carpet cleaning, I will not charge her. I'm kind of mm -hmm. on team Mike for this one, but if I like in the next agreement, maybe I could put it like how Mike yeah. Matt put it. So it's like the expectations already yeah. set. Yeah. Look at the, look at the profit. Right. So to get that per properly cleaned, it's going to be 150 bucks. Yeah. It's a small mm -hmm. room probably. Yeah. But, but, but if you have a company come do it, they have minimum charges. So my oh, yeah. guys, no matter what, they're showing up, boom, 150 bucks. And then it goes up from there based on size. Right. So mm -hmm. if you do that, you know, over the course of every single time somebody moves out and you figure what yeah. your percentages and what your returns are, yeah. that's yeah, you're a, right. probably a pretty big return. So I would just have it in their agreement that when they, when you move in, it's been, here's what it is. It's prof professionally clean. The carpets mm -hmm. have been professionally clean. You know, the walls have no defects. The mm -hmm. doors have no defects. And, you know, it's your responsibility when you move out that all of these things are Bingo. basically redone again. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cause that was at my apartment that I moved out of that. That was how they did it. So that's why mm -hmm. I was like thinking of that, but mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you both. You're very welcome. Very cool. No problem. Uh, Van Reith, you're up. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having this uh, meeting. Um, Happy to. Yeah. I like the shirt too. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's that season. The uniform is in way. Ago. Yeah. In it's Southern California, for it's, the next six months. It's uh, still 80 in Southern California. So, oh my God. <laughs> so not yeah. yeah, it's, it's not, it's final weather. It never happens really. It never happens there. That's true. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a question, um, a couple of questions here. Um, what are you looking for in like a, uh, location when you're picking out your, um, what to buy and can I explain what no one really has a definition I guess it's a squishy definition of ABC locations because yeah, sure. it kind of depends on the market can you describe what very much your market and maybe Zuber can talk about his too yeah very much um so um the markets that I'm looking for are ones that are um so for me so Mike's strategy works awesome single family homes Usually what you'll find is that that will work in, and this is not a political statement. This is fact. You can look up the numbers. Single family homes largely, largely work in blue governed states. Okay. Small multifamilies work awesome. And usually they're built more in red governed states, not red state, blue state, but look at the governor and look at the longevity of the governor, because usually it's the difference between a lot of programs and fewer programs, and then how they divvy up the tax base. So in New Hampshire, my government is very aligned with me because they get a majority of their income from property taxes. So single family homes in my area do not cash flow. They haven't in a very long time. And it's because they have a very high cost tax basis. And so for me, my state is pro landlord not pro tenant. And I prefer that as a landlord. So I had my choice to invest in Massachusetts, Maine, or New Hampshire. They're all about 17 miles apart. Um, and so I chose New Hampshire because a, that was where I was from, but what I liked much more about it was the court process was much, much faster. Like in Massachusetts, you can go five months in the winter time. If it's a mom with kids, you can't evict them. I'm not looking to evict a mom with kids, but I also can't afford to pay five months of their rent because they're never going to recover from that. So for me, political climate has a little bit of something to do with it. And I don't care how they vote nationally. Don't give two, two rips. I only care about how they vote state-wise from a govern, governing perspective, because in red states, taxes are usually higher. You know, 
So like Florida property taxes are higher and Texas property taxes are higher and New Hampshire property taxes are higher. But the government is far more aligned with a landlord than they are with a tenant. They need that tax base. And if they know if I'm not getting rent, I can't afford my taxes. <laughs> yeah. You want to talk about A, B, and C for you? Sure. Um, a to me is brand new ground up. Well, so as I'm comparing it to how I feel about it versus the market, the market A is usually brand new build. Yeah. For me, the market isn't, I want to do an, uh, an, and so an A quality area is going to be brand new build and brand new. Um, for me, I try to do uh, B and C areas with A, B and C product because I, Everybody that just goes in and they're a one trick pony and all they do is gut and rehab. The problem that you're going to have is that you're getting rid of, I believe in feeder systems and farm systems, like in baseball, where I have a unit that's clean and safe. And that's likely where a tenant's going to start. The next step up for them is clean, safe, and upgraded. I.e. I've done some upgrades. I've, you know, maybe done a, a light setup. Um, you know, we've gone through, we've done a bunch of electrical, we've got newer appliances, um, things like that. So kind of clean, safe and upgraded. Um, and then the next step up for me is basically clean, safe and updated. Meaning I've done a kitchen, I've done floors, I've done, you know, my kitchen setup. Um, that's what, that's what that market is for me. And so there's, I have tenants that have been with me that have just worked through my quality of products. Um, they started out as I just need clean and safe. And then they went to clean, safe and updated or clean, safe and upgraded. And then they went to clean, safe and updated. And so when I say updated, that's not a new build, but it's pretty damn close. It's gutted. It's down to wall, you know, down to studs. It's new electrical. It's, you know, new plumbing. Uh, it's new fixtures. I mean, it basically doubles as a brand new build. It's just not a brand new build. Okay. Yeah, for me, generally speaking, when people talk about A, B, and C areas, it's generally age. Yeah. Roughly speaking, sub five years is your A areas, because that's the only stuff that really can pencil for developers. B is kind of 20 years to five years. And generally speaking, C is greater than 20 years. Now, in California, that might be a little bit longer, uh, given we don't have the same weather conditions as, as some states. Um, <laughs> but generally, it, it is kind of age of building and infrastructure. Um, in my area, even in Fresno Central Valley, A areas have never cash flowed. Just yeah. not even close. I think I bought one property during the collapse that that was, you know, generally speaking an A area, but that was, you know, luck really. Uh, B and C areas is where the most of the cash flow is. Some things that I look for that maybe a lot of people don't is I still drive my properties. Yeah. When I'm when I'm driving a new area that I that I don't know if is A or B, one of the things that I look for is grass. How many of the yards have green grass or relatively green grass? Versus how many are have been watered so long it's basically dirt. Because one of the things that, that generically tells me, and it's not always the case, but generally tells me the percentage of renters versus owners. Generally speaking, owners take more care because it's theirs, generally speaking. Um, but that is something I look for. I would call a C area something I drove through where the properties are 50 years old, and it's basically dirt lots. Like there's not a lick of grass on the entire street. Um, you probably have cars parked up on jacks. These are just things that come together when I'm driving down the street. But that doesn't mean I don't invest there. Mm. That just means I know what I'm getting into. And to mm -hmm. Matt's point, it really controls what I upgrade. Absolutely. Right. So um, I think A, B, and C get a lot of talk about because they are squishy, to kind of use your word. They are. But mm -hmm. it's, to me, it's age. I mean, you could have, like, like for example, uh, you're in Long Beach. Do I remember that right, Ben Reed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's pro so there really isn't a lot of new development in Long Beach. Maybe there's a couple of infill lots, you know, a couple of things going on. But Long Beach is such a pricey area. You know, there's probably homes that were built 100 years ago that are, look brand new. Yeah, right? I, I've lived in one of those. Exactly, yeah. right? So um, it's really hard to say. But generally speaking, A, B, and C. A, B, and C makes a lot more sense on apartments. 
Okay. That's where A, yeah. B, and C comes in. It's apartments. It it's amenities, right? A class A has a pool, a gym, you know, laundry facilities. A B will have uh, one pool versus two pools. It'll have this, that, the other. A, B, and C got their names because of apartments. We as real estate investors try to bring that to single family. It's not really the same, hence squishy. Okay. Yeah. Clean, clean. The idea is at a base, you want clean and safe. Yes. Yeah. Always. And then yeah, clean, yeah. safe and updated and then clean, safe and upgraded, you know, really is the, the spectrum. Yep. Very, very cool. Do you have so, another one, Vin Reed? Okay. Yeah. Um, going along with that, how do you know when it becomes a place becomes, uh, you know, swings from unsafe to safe or vice versa? Like, mm -hmm. how do you know when the neighborhood kind of turns? Yeah. I mean, you can kind of, I mean, I think it, so I've bought in a good economy, uh, something that <laughs> went from a D to a C and then to a B minus, and then the economy went bad and it went back to D hard. Um, so I think that the challenge is as you see, you don't want to be first on that list. Cause usually the people that are first on that list, it's either getting lucky or it's a big developer who's making a massive investment in a certain area because they have enough swag to pull it off. Um, and so for me, you know, as far as looking at an area going from, uh, you know, C, C, B, and D is I look at the town next door and then that stuff starts to creep in. If they're the town next door is really blowing up and they're, you know, really doing a ton of build and a ton of new product. I know that it's going to push people out of that area into the next town. And so I've, I've started early in some of these other towns. There's a town right now that I started buying in 13 years ago. I was buying single family houses for 60 grand. The cheapest one for sale in the market now is 250. But that 250 one doesn't cash flow anymore. But the duplexes, the duplexes there, I used to buy for 120, 130. Now they're 350, 400. So what you really start to look for is, is the town that you're already doing business in, are they just doing a bunch of new development? Is that what that continues to be? Um, that's how I've done it in the past. I don't know that it's very scientific, but Mike probably has a better answer for scientific. One of the things that I look for when I drive around areas to see if they are improving or not improving is what's going on with the commercial segment, right? Are stores opening? Are they closing? Yeah. Uh, are we getting name brand stores versus one, one shop stores? Um, generally speaking, if a Starbucks goes in or you know, a, a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or any of these other kind of name brands into a new spot. That's a sign, right? They, they have all these data scientists running around doing all these things. So I, when I'm trying to figure out an area, I first start with a commercial segment. Are they opening or closing? Second, when you're starting to get into big neighborhoods, right? There's not a really a commercial artery. How many dumpsters? Right. That tells me if it's increasing. And I've I've been a part of some segments in Fresno where for whatever reason, two or three flippers went in, then five or six followed, and the entire neighborhood's different. Yeah. That was about a four or five year journey. That was that was fun to see and be a part of. Dumpsters will tell you. And then with their going the other direction, getting worse, I watch the cars. Do the cars go from Mercedes to something less than that? Do the cars suddenly not have, you know, four hubcaps, right? Are we seeing cars <laughs> on blocks? I mean, you can see, a, you can see, a, like, just watch the cars. Are the cars getting better or worse? Because that'll tell you what's going on in the, uh, the you know, the, the household dynamics. Um, there are signs. I also drive later. I'll yeah, drive, drive like, at late, night. Drive, drive night. 10, 11 o'clock at night. Make one night where you drive it at midnight or one in the morning. If you see activity at one in the morning... Uh, and more than one house that's start going to start to get dicey in all likelihood. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are all good points to kind of assess what's happening. Um, awesome. So what, uh, one last question. Um, sure. What's the, uh, for kind of both of your students, like what, what's the light bulb moment for them that it kind of clicks um, like whatever situation they're in. So I currently don't have any, uh, rentals but like it's kind of like this big hurdle this mountain like it's probably pretty small compared to other people but i'm like it's just the hurdle is like the 
it's hard to get my, you know, get everything kind of in motion and then also mm-hmm. get the mindset right. And then um, if you have setbacks and such, like yep. what's that, what's that light bulb I, moment? I hope the first light bulb moment, because again, my job is to take you from the stance to the field. So we'll let Matt go next. I'll be back is in one second. You, Keep going. Yep. I think the answer is when you write your first great offer, not when you get your first deal. When you can confidently put pen to paper and know with certainty that this is going to produce X yield, which is more than average by a significant amount, I want to shake your hand. Even if it's 30% less than list price, you have done something. So yes, I send cards out when you get your first deal and when you get your next deal. But if I had a way to send out cards when you write your first great offer, I think that needs to be celebrated. So that is the light bulb moment I'm chasing. When a student goes, in your case, I've been looking in Long Beach. I've been doing this 103 days. I saw this property on Main Street. It's a little bit listed more, but I think there's a fourth bedroom and not a, it's not really a three. I'm going to write a, you know, an, a, an offer that's 19% below list price. And you don't care if you get a yes answer. You won. That's the light bulb moment I'm chasing, and I hope all of you get to. I can't promise a deal. I cannot promise that sellers will sell at a price that produces a great yield. But if I can get you to the point where you confidently write an offer you feel great about, I did my job. That's the light bulb moment I chase. Yeah, I think um, I think for me is, you know, in my course, I've got people kind of in your position where they have zero, and I have people all the way up to 60 and 70 units. Um, and so it's been powerful for me is seeing that across the spectrum, it's just how much more you can learn. And I think the thing that scares anybody is fear of the unknown, right? You have no idea what's going to happen when you become a landlord. And so Mike takes a lot of the guessing out of how to write the offer, how to shop for a good deal. You know, it was really funny. Mike and I were talking about it one day and he's like, yeah, he's like, this is what's great about the course. It's like a teach people how to find a good deal. I said, see, it's not it for me at all. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, it keeps me from making a bad deal. Yeah. I don't want to make a good deal. I just don't want to make a bad deal. If I make a bad deal, I'm going to get stuck. And so for me, what's most fun for my students is completely demystifying all these things out there that 90% of people don't even know. You're instantly, I have beyond a shadow of a doubt in my course, it is nine and a half hours of recorded teachings. If you're in a boot camp, it's another 28 hours. If you don't know infinitely more than anybody else you're talking to after that, because you're getting literally 22 years of experience, a hundred flips that I touched myself, that I've managed myself, that I've had the interaction with my tenants, I've had the interaction with housing, I've had the inter- interaction with contractors, I've had the interaction with the stupid tub that I could not get out of a damn unit. I've had all of those interactions. And so that's where the key comes in is it's like everybody gets nervous because it's the fear of the unknown. They don't have no idea what they're going to run into or how a tenant's going to handle this. That's what we do is we kind of demystify all that because we say, hey, when a tenant writes you a nasty gram, here's how you respond. You know, when a tenant, um, you know, does this or when a contractor does that or when the city calls, here's how you respond to that. And it's really giving people examples and real life examples where you can then deal with that. Now it's not unknown anymore. You're like, oh man, this is awesome. There was actually a part in the boot camp where Matt covered that for an hour. I'm going to go rewatch that before I respond. It's that type of stuff. So really the key, the light bulb moment for me is when people realize this really isn't as tough as it is. What I need to do is I need to game up on as much experience as I can get. And right now, short of going through it yourself, the most important thing you can have is educating yourself as to what it might look like. And so that's what's the light bulb moment for a lot of the students that are in my class is they're just like, I, I mean, I literally had this wonderful lady. In fact, uh, she watches Mike as well, uh, Anna Kay. She's late 50s, has one rental, and she's just like, because of the course, I feel bold. I don't get scared when my phone rings anymore from my PM. And she also can hold them accountable. She said there was one example where I think she said she saved like $800 or something because she was able to challenge them on something. That's the, that's what's worth its weight to me because I 85% 
or 90% of real estate agents are completely useless. Um, it's the same for PMs. 80 to 90% of them are complete garbage and they're just looking to fee the heck out of you. And at the end of the day, when you can look at a spreadsheet and go, they made more for my properties than I did this year, that's that's a problem. So that's what's most exciting for me with my students is that they get through it and they're just like, I don't feel afraid for the phone to ring anymore. I can It can ring and I'm going to have an answer. You good, Henry? Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's yeah, I'm excited and a little bit uh, fearful. But you know, that's that's kind of like I get it. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. It's okay. Believe it or not, I used to be non-confrontational. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. It's a true story. There you go. All right. Okay. Uh, it looks Welcome. like Adam jumped ahead of John, but I think John was next. So we'll go to John next, and Adam after that. John, you're up. If John's there, I think he was waiting for us. So maybe, John, maybe. Oh, we'll go to Adam then. Adam C. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Can. Yeah, there you is. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Had a, all righty. Um, so I have a I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to specifically get into like a live work property, like a like apartment above, but I'm looking at older buildings. I think I'd asked this last time I was in here. Um, but what what are the specific things you would look for if you're looking for a building around so like or a true older? mixed use? True mixed yeah, use. Yeah, true like, mixed use, but but I'm going okay. to do it. Like like kind of the yeah. same way people house hack. I have a yep. business and I'm going to yep. put it in there Love and try that. and use yeah. So like try and take advantage of commercial properties. Did it kind of okay. Yeah. Great. Did so. it? Love it. Awesome. All right. So you're rare. Uh, there aren't a lot of people that are looking for that. So I love this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to and there's a family that just passed it down to their kids and their kids have already moved to Florida and are spending mm. their money and are liquidating their property. So there's a couple Perfect. that I'm working with the real estate agents. So a hundred plus year property, what would your worry be? What are the things you're most looking for when you're looking to buy something like that? Where's it located? Um, it's in Delaware city, Delaware. So it's like near the water, okay. but it's an older property. Yeah. I just ask only because it, it you know, a hundred years old in some places is different than a hundred years old in other places. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's a newer one. There's, you know, I have 1700 of properties. You, you probably have some around your area too. So I, I do sadly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, with the old eight by eight and 10 by 10 chestnut beams in the middle. Yeah. I've got some yeah. of those. Um, but you know, I think the, the, the key is, you know, really understanding. So I build a rent box in that case, because the thing yeah. that I want to most understand is, when my business has outgrown the asset, what's my actual opportunity for market rent? Okay. Where am I, where am I going to actually be? Um, because for me, I fell in love with a commercial property that came up and I was like, oh man, that's awesome. And admittedly, I'm buying it because when I'm out of it, it has much, much, much higher upside. Mm -hmm. So what I look for is on any of that older stuff, it's the same thing as it usually is, which is I'm looking for foundation. I'm looking for roof. I'm looking for a uh, heating system. Um, I'm looking for, because it's going to be some sort of a public space. I'm now, you know, more looking at like lead, you know, lead remediation, things like that. Um, that sort of thing. When, when you're looking at something that old um, and, and that's usually anything that's more than 50 years old, but the, the, the element that you introduce, is it being a commercial property? That's the element that, that makes it really different than everything else. So, um, is it retail commercial on the first Adam, or is it just uh, commercial commercial? So I'm talking to the city. Yeah. They're, they're trying to redo this area. And of course. Uh, so they really want to have retail there. They'll let you on a few year basis. If you're like, if I'm getting in there and I'm redoing it, they've been pretty clear that they're like, Hey, if you're going to move it to retail, you might be able to set it up as a service thing. And you'd like, but they want you within a couple of years having a customer focus because they're trying to get more foot traffic down there and they're working really hard on that. So yeah. it's kind of a weird situation. I've never had to deal with like a, I only have one rental, but I have a family, you know, my family also has some properties, but nobody's ever dealt with this commercial side of it. Yep. So I'm just trying to see what are the main things someone who kind of has done plenty of work would look for on an older property, knowing that you are probably going to have customers in there within a few years, even if I'm I, renting it myself. Yeah, fair enough. I think, like I said, I think the big thing is, is just making sure that they're not going to, um, that you're grandfathered in on things like a sprinkler system is going to cost you 30 G's, Okay. you know, to put a sprinkler system in there is going to suck and okay. they look crappy and they're expensive. And they're in a small retail space like that. They're, and the argument is it's not going to save anybody anyway. 
Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, if there's a fire, like because a, a computer blew up, they're going to run out the front door. Like it's not going to save anybody anyway. So that's one of the conversations I would have is making sure they're not going to make you sprinkle it. Um, and then, like I said, when it comes to retail, just making sure that, you know, the space has been kind of clean up, i.e. not, you know, kind of lead free. Um, because you never know, you know, what issue that might come. Th- those rules are only getting more and more difficult. And the last thing you would want to have happen is you have to shut down to make it that. So you're better off doing that before you open up, before it goes live. And then it puts you in a better position too with when you're going to rent it, it's going to be a done property. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's was, there's two th- yeah. two things I would add to that because I have a couple of these properties as well. And, and I've had them for seven to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that got me was signage. Interesting. Right? Yep. S- sure. Signage, the rules around signage change. And that may affect the architecture. So that would be something I would definitely check out signage. And then um, ADA, um, handicap. Yeah, yeah. the bathroom's not ADA. I already looked at that. Yeah, that and also, so that got me, uh, but also access to the living quarters. Um, The the, uh, stairway was too narrow, which caused a big ass problem. Um, When you have that mix between retail, right, the public, and then, you know, clients in at the top it's just a lot more ada than i had expected you yeah usually in um depending on the retail business ada is is it can be a thing or it can also not be a thing right that's depending where it's really expected. important yeah. yeah so the other thing too is is making sure this the challenge is they can say here's the retail we would allow there and then you basically build it based on that and then five years later they say yeah we don't want those four things anymore and we don't want those there anymore that so happened. that's one of the challenges, but of the, of the big things, the ones that you can control, it's going to be sprinkler. It's going to be, you know, the, the lead on the inside. It's going to be that stuff. Yeah. Furnace the other room. thing that the last thing I remember was windows. One of the big things they wanted on our, on our building, like after we owned it for five years is they wanted us to they actually sent us a letter, uh, strongly suggesting that we make bigger windows that face the public street. Real because they were, yeah they did yeah they wanted bigger windows they were too small because it it went from being a duplex like residential area to mixed use to a retail retail corridor so they wanted all the the buildings that face this certain street and it's the tower district I've bitched about a lot of time on my channel <laughs> they had to have eight by eight windows or some gigantic windows oh, crazy dear God yeah it was painful those are cheap <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, they're like thousands of dollars for yeah, a slab of glass. To- yeah, you had to re-engineer the frame and all. Yeah, and it's reframe everything. Yep. 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 So. Okay. Um. So when you're doing a walkthrough, if you were going and looking at this property, like if you're looking at something in that like hundred year or whatever, would you consider getting somebody who like an inspector? Because I looked around and I I was able to find a couple. You know, obviously it's more expensive, but look for a specific inspector with experience with older buildings or like yep. historic inspectors. Absolutely. I know yep. your area probably absolutely. Has them too. Yeah. Okay. So that's definitely Absolutely. worth Pay for yeah. it. Those those guys that take a five day course, useless in this situation. Okay. Useless. So, useless. Right. And then would you look for would you have a I have a family member as a generic contractor and probably gonna have a go through as well. So my hope yes. is get them to go and then do have the historic inspector go through the general contractor and then me, all three of us with you know, mm-hmm. get same time. Property. Yeah. Same yeah. time. My requirement for an inspector mm-hmm. is that they have at least 10 years construction experience. I will not hire an inspector otherwise. So when I get stuck and I need an inspector because somebody canceled or whatever happened, I I will not take anybody that has less than 10 years construction experience. Cause a lot of the older guys, they get out of construction and they get into inspecting. And there are a thousand times the inspector that some guy who got a five day cert or a seven day cert. Okay. Yeah. That's all my questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Nailed Thank it. you Adam. Good path. Yep. Sounds like a fun project. Uh, John, yeah. we'll go back to you. I don't know if uh, we got you, John. Can you hear me now? There he is. Hi, John. Okay. Hey, I wanted to thank you both and thank everybody else who's here actually as well. Sure. Um, I'm currently rented. I'm approved for a duplex hack, just so that you know. Um, mm-hmm. My biggest question is all about the rent box. Could you yeah. go into a little bit of detail on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the rent box is much like the buy box. Um, however, it's putting a lot more, it's putting all of the weight on the rents. 
And the reason why that's important is because so often when landlords are selling a property, why are they selling it? They're selling it because they're financially in trouble because they can't afford to keep up with it. Why can they not afford to keep up with it? Because they don't know the rents. The rents are too low. And so I've literally bought properties where she's just like, I'm so glad to be rid of this thing. I'm so tired of writing checks. Well, she was renting out three bedroom, one bath for 1200 bucks a month. I bought the building. One of the units was section eight. Within 60 days, I was getting 1950 for that unit that she was getting 1200 bucks for. She was just lazy and didn't know what she was doing. I got 750 bucks a month more for the same unit, not making one improvement because that's what the market was. And she just wasn't in tune and she'd have been better off hiring me as a consultant. I would have gotten her a lot more money for the house, you know, but I go in there and I get it for 19. And then the one on the downstairs, I just said, listen, you've been here for five years. Here's what the market rents are. So, uh, so basically Dion's binder strategy. I've been doing that via text message for about a decade where I'm just like, Hey, I own the building here, here, and here. I, I've seen these units. This is what they're listed at. Um, I would love to have you stay, but I need to get a little bit closer. I need to get closer to that number. And then having that conversation. And then that person came back and they're paying 15. So I got 300 out of one. 750 out of the other, it's 1050 a month. Here's the thing that property made money barely, but it made money at what I bought it at. Now it makes 24% or something return on capital. So the rent box really is important with setting your market from a rents perspective, because I was told for two years by every other person that lost to me with all the other properties I bought, you're overpaying, you're overpaying, you're overpaying. You're just paying too much. You're just buying everything you can. You're overpaying. I wasn't overpaying. They were, I asked one of the guys who I, I call him my permanent silver medal because he always finishes second to me. <laughs> and uh, on the last one, I gave him a little, a little like tin of silver polish just to rub it in. Uh, he's a local investor too. Um, but he doesn't understand that he was counting those units at 2,200 bucks a side. I was counting them at 3,000 a side. I was able to offer 525 based on my numbers. He was dumb enough to offer 507 based on his numbers, which were 2,200 a month. I make way more money at 3,000 bucks a month aside on 525 than he does anywhere near on 507 at 2,200. So that is the constant difference that I see is that it helps you create more opportunity. It helps you create the buy box is critical. And when you add rent box to it, it actually gets you that next level that might help you find one or two more deals because it's a landlord that's getting out of it. It's not a fit for them anymore. There's not enough margin there. They're too afraid to raise rents. They don't have the personality for it. Those are all things that are possible. Um, but that's where the rent box. And so the way that we do the rent box is we basically will look at a given market. We'll look at what the quality of the rental is. We'll look at where the location of the rental is. We'll look at what it's renting for, what it's marketed for. We'll watch it for a couple of weeks and we can go backwards two weeks. So because you're not having to do it for 60 or 90 days, because rents change too much in a 90 day period, we're only going back two weeks to look at what did the last two weeks worth of units post for and did they get rented? And a lot of times you'll see them flip to get rented and that's just a two week exercise, but that can vastly improve what you can offer on that asset because you can sit there and know I can get three grand a month on this. And, and that deal that I bought that he was thinking 2,200, I'm three grand a month on that. And that property makes like 1700 bucks a month. That one duplex makes 1700 a month because it's that much more profit that he just didn't think was there. And quite frankly, the existing owner wasn't properly managing it. They didn't yeah, know what they had. The rent box idea in, in tracking rents down to the last two or three weeks has frankly never been more important than the last two years. Absolutely. Right? We have seen, you know, inflation rent jumps uh, pretty astronomical. Mm -hmm. uh, so knowing knowing what rents are, right? Rents are a part of your, your spreadsheet that all of you are building. Um, it's the income column, obviously. Knowing that number and feeling good about it, it's important. And if you think rents are three, and somebody else thinks they're 2200 and and if you're right you can pay a little more and the yield actually goes up it does yeah it does yeah it's one of those core tenets of how you create more opportunity than your competition yep. john did you have a uh, question too? mentally oh go ahead yeah i think the challenge for me mentally is that i'm paying about 40 percent below market rate for where i'm renting right now sure which i'm very happy about i yeah. bet um, i bet yeah but that means when I go into the duplex, more than likely it's going to be an alligator 
for sure while I live there and and take money away from the savings for the next property. It has to be. So there'll be more upside when I move out, like you said. There's going to be more upside, but the but the bigger thing too is is that, you know, when buying that type of an asset now, they're going to base it on market rent and what you need to be able to provide for because they'll so the way that they base the value of a duplex is always based on comps. And then there's a side number of, but it also, there's this, they do the income approach as well, but they put all the weight on the comp side. Right. What else it sold like? The issue is, is that that's where I've found an inefficiency in the system. They only care what the last one sold for. I don't give two rips what the last one sold for. I only care about what the rents are. I don't care what it's sold for. I care about what my rate is and what it's sold for, because that's what makes my payment. And my payment is minus you know, from my rents, which is my, my gross income. So that's where there's huge opportunity in the market with these dupes, tries and quads is that most real estate agents that list multifamily are not multifamily specialists. They don't know the first thing about how to calculate proper yield or return on capital. Mm -hmm. And they certainly don't know what rents are. Like, you know, you, so you've done some work, you know, that you're 40% below market on rent. A lot of people have no clue. And they're just like, damn landlord trying to get rich off me single-handedly rents are so expensive and you're 40% of the market. Right. And so that's the thing is that most renters don't even know. They really don't. I literally told somebody, I said, you know what? I think it's time for us to move on. She goes, fine. I'm happy to. I said, sounds good. Be out by the end of the month. And then she came back three days later and goes, I was wondering if we could, uh, if I could stay. Yeah. Why? She went out and she looked at the rents. She saw what the market was. And I told her, no, I'm not interested. We're going to move on. She's like, well, I might not be out in time. I said, that's okay. I said, on the first, you're going to get another notice saying that your rent's going up to what market is. And so that way it's like, uh, for us, it was the way to get rid of a tenant that was just constantly fussing and whining about nothing. And they were just a nightmare to manage and deal with. And it was like, sounds good. She, We don't ever want to displace somebody. And so what we're waiting for is for them to basically qualify themselves in as I need to be replaced. Very, very cool. We have uh, a little bit over 10 minutes. We will try to keep, uh, we got three more hands up. John, did you have a one final question? I do. Um, where are you looking to find those rents? I make them myself. So I look at Facebook Mark. I look at all the places that I would post it for rent. I look at Facebook Marketplace. I look at Craigslist. Um, I look at Zillow. Um, I look at everywhere that they post, you know, because every city or every town has a different place. A lot of towns, it's Facebook okay. Marketplace, it's Craigslist. Um, a lot of cities, it's Zillow, it's Apartments.com. It really matters what your market is and where you find a majority of your rentals. And so for me, it's almost always Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, and a little bit of Zillow. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Thank you, John. Paul, you're up. Hello, can you hear me? I yep. can. Yep. Um, I wanted to go back to tenant turnover a little bit. Um, in my experience, that seems to be the great profit killer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mine mine uh, too. Yep. Um, it sounds like you guys are getting the tenants to pay for pretty much all of re the repair costs. I am. And, and I seem to constantly getting stuck with significant costs every turnover. So how can I prevent that? Great question. Um, so from my perspective, that's actually part of the course. We have how we basically document that stuff, how we basically put in our lease that you are receiving the unit professionally cleaned, um, you know, essentially error free or issue free. Um, and then you have five days upon moving in to report anything. Otherwise it's on you. And okay. so for, for me, when they leave, I have tenants where I literally put cleaners in there and three people are done in an hour and I get a bill for a hundred bucks. I am ecstatic to pass that bill for only a hundred bucks onto the tenant. I just had somebody move out that constantly deems themselves on social media as a clean freak. And she's the biggest off most worst, the worst tenant I've ever seen. She had a $600 cleaning bill. She's, she lives like an absolute pig. And I was like, you self-identify as a clean freak and you can't spell clean. It's not even close to clean. And so I gave her a, I took a $600 bill out of her deposit and enjoyed every minute of it. And I didn't charge her for my time to set up the cleaner, you know? And so it's, it's truly, if I go in front of a judge, 
my time is the cost of doing business, but the cleaner's time isn't. And so I got a $600 invoice that I literally just passed on to her or, pa or made as part of her uh, uh, deposit return is what it was. Yeah, the, the key to charging back is really documenting the move-in process. Um, the lease, the contract, take pictures. Now you can take video. Yep. Um, even better. Um, that is really the game changer is documenting. It used to be pictures. Now we actually do some video sometimes. Yep. So we do as well. Okay. And then what about when the repairs exceed the deposit? I send them a bill. Really? Yep. Absolutely. Hmm. And you get it. Sometimes. Some, not always. Not always, but sometimes. So they're just out of their goodness of their heart. They pay the bill or how does that work? Oh No, my, my letters may be a little bit nastier than that. It is here's your deposit. Here's all the deductions that we took. Here's what still your responsibility. Um, we hope to hear back from you in the next two weeks. If they haven't sent something in within two weeks, we send them another certified letter costs mm -hmm. us four bucks. And if we don't hear back from them again, then we decide whether or not we want to uh, take it to small claims because in most States, when you take somebody to small claims and you get the judgment against them, uh, if they, they will agree to some sort of a payment. If they don't pay on that payment, it usually issues a bench warrant. And then the next time they get pulled over in a car or whatever, they get arrested. Okay. Yeah. So I've done small claims. Uh, I would say my average collection is 30%, but you just never know about every year or so I get several thousand dollars from past claims because of people got inheritance or whatever it's on the record. And it that is. will be, that will be paid when monies are coming. So you may not get the money the first time, first month, the first year, but I'm still shocked. I mean, I just got an $8,700 um, check for something I did two years ago. It was pretty shocking. Oh, okay. And that's for filing a small claims report. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, yeah small. And, and that's the thing is if you sent them those letters, you'll go sit in front of the judge, say, Hey, I've sent them all these letters. There's been no response. Here's proof of all the work having been done. Yep. They'll ask the person, do you have any defense to that? They'll say, well, but he's a jerk. Well, I'm not an $8,700 jerk. So it is what it is. And you're going to have to pay. And that's how it goes. Okay. And they lose. Okay. And then and you then, try and work out some sort of a payment plan that they can afford, which is, you know, can be 10 bucks or 20 bucks a month. Okay. And if somebody's in a house for say five years and the house needs to be repainted and the deposit doesn't cover that, is that something you still would pass on to the tenant or is that just wear and tear? It depends would, on the above and beyond stuff. Most of the time that's wear and tear. But yeah, if they put the a industry. bunch of holes and yeah. like, you know, mass, massive work, then I would show the total bill. And then I would say, but here's the stuff that was just beyond the pale, you know? And so I would might charge them a fraction of that. Yeah. So. In, in my situation, five years, I would probably charge them for the holes, the repair of the holes, but I would do the painting. For yep. example. Okay. I agree. And things like a super dirty oven and refrigerator, is that wear and tear or is that? Nope. Nope. That's your, that's your disgusting. Yep. I charge. Yep, absolutely. And in fact, in depending on the state that you're in, I actually make a price sheet as part of my list and mm -hmm. say, if you leave it dirty, here's what the cost is for us to clean it. Okay. Yeah. I love how many notes Gina's taking. She's written a book in this time. It's been awesome. I've been watching how many notes you're taking. It's good. Paul, do you have one last question, bud? No, thank you. Awesome. Man. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Gina, we're going to go, we're going to play ping pong. We'll go one at a time. Gina, Adam, Gina, Adam, because you both asked. So we'll go Gina first. See how fast these are. You're on mute. Oh, I see you there. You're on mute. Oh, maybe she took her hand down. Thank oh, you. There you go. My sure question is. is, when is your next, when's your next live boot camp start? So we do um, probably in January is then when the next one starts. I think we have like two or three spots left because we limit it to 15 people. 15 to 17 people. We don't go any more than that because it's every, uh, it's two hours a week. And I want to make sure that everybody gets questions about the content, but also about whatever issue they're dealing with at that time. Um, and then the course, but you can sign up. So we also, we cover coursework in there too. So usually people sign up for the course and then they do the boot camp when, when the time fits them. It doesn't, it's not one of those things that runs out. So you still have time to access it anytime in the first year. And then if you have like an acute problem where you're just like, Matt, I need you to come in here and kind of solve this for me. We have like a three hour block where I just sit down and we get together and we brainstorm. That's just one-on-one. -on -one. So we have all three of those options. 
And so where do we just sign up on your website? Yep. Yeah. You can look right at the website, look at the syllabus, read through it, you know, see that there's value there. And then we always do, we're adding one that's specifically around lead. I had a, uh, an $83,000 lead order. Oof. So I'm going to teach people exactly how to defeat the orders. Yeah. And so we're teaching that in the course and that's all, that's nothing additional. That's going to be in the course um, for, for those that are in it. Cause I can't teach that on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, all right. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Adam. All righty. Um, question on the commercial property thing again, is, yeah. is managing rentals like commercial? What's, what's the big differences? I guess the question is kind of for both. It's guys. worse. Okay. You have to have a better response time. But yeah. also you can charge, they can, they assume a lot more responsibilities. Yep. Yeah, it's I, worse I learned when... that the hard way when I had my own warehouse, I saw when yeah. they were like, I was like, it's broken. They were like, yeah, tough shit. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's sometimes called triple net. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah there, there's the bonus side like Matt, uh, well, like uh, uh, Mike was saying, which is it's a, it's a big bonus, you know, when it comes to like triple net and then paying all that stuff. The downside is, is that if there is something that really is yeah. a landlord problem, you better respond really fast. Otherwise you're going to get damages. Yeah. Damages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the yeah. Gina, do you have another question? Was there going to go one for one here? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah. We got just a little bit of time here. When you structured your thing with your own business and your own property, were they separate LLCs? And did you do a cross billing like through accountants or anything? Do you know what I mean? Were you in the LLC so paying rich. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah, the way Mike did it. That's so I have, um, so I do it, but I do trust to the LLC. Okay. Yep. A any particular reason you did one or the other? I mean, not ask for accounting advice here. I have my own, but it just, you know, sure. I do trust. I did the trust because the cost of acquisition and LLCs, all the extra insurances, all the extra taxes, everything that, and, and it doesn't offer you the protections that people do. I have nine attorneys. I had one attorney that literally got sued. They went after both of her LLCs and then they got to her privately. So she's just like, wow. if they're single, if, unless they are real partners, if you have an actual real partner that you're not related to, where they have separate finances, then yeah, LLC. If it's you, you and your wife, you and domestic partner, whatever it's. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah. I set them up as LLCs because they were really separate and different from anything else I was doing. It's yeah. Really easy to create the separation. Yep. Okay. And then um, in that same vein, rent box would you set up like kind of a rent box or anything like when you were doing on the commercial side is it kind I of the same up, thing in the good i set up a rent box for everything i yeah, want to look at too. price per square foot i want to everything i do a rent box on because yep. that's what tells me what i can pay yep because okay. again i want i may not be there forever so i want to know my exit so i didn't know it was called exactly. rent box but i did the same exact thing exactly yeah okay perfect thank you guys uh, welcome very cool uh matt bring us home wrap it up buddy thanks again yeah. I mean, excited to do this with you guys, as always. Um, you guys are well on your path. You couldn't be with a, you know, a, a better investor. I mean, Mike's got the uh, chops to prove it over 20 years. Um, so it was a pleasure spending time with you guys. I do a live stream on Sundays, 1130 a.m. Eastern time, usually. <laughs> um, You're about a half hour yeah. late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh no, I'm, 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 it's all done. I'm done by one o'clock on the Eastern, oh. on the, on the East Coast. But yeah, do the live stream there. Come hang out, ask questions, but follow me on Instagram because I actually update all of my projects. It's Lumberjack Landlord on Instagram. I update all of my project work on that yeah. site, so you That's guys fun see to exactly watch. the work that we're doing. It's fun to watch most days, but it's fun, <laughs> more fun for you guys because you yeah. don't have to write the check. I have to write the check. So it's less yeah. fun for me, but yeah, watch that. And you'll see projects all the time and, and people talking about them. Uh, Matt, you're amazing. You do a great job. Thanks, Just man. two hours. Uh, once again, showed you why you're the guy on the field, uh, whether it was talking about prices or cost four, three, two, one was a, a, just awesome to start this ninth grade dropout doing amazing things. So whether you're six figures in debt, like Dion, or you, you don't have the, this real estate investing is a skill. You it can is. learn it. You can get better. If you do it for five to 10 to 15 to 20 years, your chances of being wealthy are really, really, really good, guys. Take care of yourself. Have fun. Bye. Bye, guys. Take care.